get to this story in Mark where Jesus is in Capernaum. A lot has already taken place. If you look at Mark, a lot has taken place in a very little bit of narrative. It, he really goes boom right through that whole beginning until he gets to this moment of Capernaum because I think for the author of Mark, this is when the ministry really begins and the good news is an action of being taken into the community. So to understand that action, I think a review of what Mark says getting to this place could be helpful for context. Mark begins by relating how John the Baptist is in the wilderness of the River Jordan baptizing people. And people from all over Judea and the countryside are coming to him and finding John in the wilderness at the River Jordan to be baptized. And Jesus is among those. And Jesus comes from Nazareth, says Mark, and makes a long journey to where John is located. And we believe that to be just a little bit outside of Jericho, where the River Jordan comes close. And after Jesus has this experience of baptism, and out of that experience we have this confirmation that he is a beloved child of God. Thank you. Then he goes out into the wilderness. In fact, what Mark says is that Jesus is driven out by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. And in that time, Whatever he's doing, he is discerning about what to do next. And then John is arrested. John the Baptist is arrested, and that's not a good thing. That is a very dangerous thing. Because the community and John himself had identified Jesus as the next leader. As the one that God had sent into the world to lead a new movement. No pressure. <laughs> but with John arrested, guess who's the next leader? After his time of discernment in the wilderness, then Jesus heads north to Capernaum. If you have a map in your head with me, Jericho, most south in this story, with the River Jordan. Going north from there is where John's is seen community would have been located, and we believe with good reason that John the Baptist was associated with the Assyrian community north of Jericho and north of the Jordan where that was. And farther north still is Capernaum. This whole area is within the jurisdiction of Herod and within the jurisdiction of Pontius Pilate, who's kind of been given this particular area of Judea to oversee. Capernaum is the most far north in that eastern section, the most far north town located on the northeast side of the Lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, Genesaret. Before you, right after you go to Capernaum, that is the most far north town there. And if you go farther north, you're getting to another jurisdiction. They're not overseen by the local governor, but a whole other uh, person is looking over that. A whole other jurisdiction. So you're outside the control of whoever is governing today. That's important because when you get to Capernaum and you're looking around <laughs> Capernaum, the toll booth that goes into the next jurisdiction is literally steps away from where we believe Peter's house is located. Now, here's what's interesting today. If you were to go to Capernaum today, <coughs> you would see a lot of very nicely excavated ruins from the first century and the Byzantine era. We can tell the occupation levels by the kind of stone that's used in building the foundations of the dwellings that were there. In the first century, the local folks picked up the easiest stones to find, <laughs> and that were these nice, rich, black, uh, volcanic rock, very sturdy stuff. So the foundations of the first century homes that we find are out of this nice black rock. 
Later on in the Byzantine era, the 5th century, you get a little bit different kinds of lighter rock. They've gone and quarried that and brought it in. But right now, if you walk to Concordum, you would see, over some of these ruins, this giant building that looks all the world like a giant spaceship. It looks like a big spaceship. It's got a saucer and legs that come down into the ground. And there's a ramp going up into the saucer. And you can look underneath the saucer and still see the various ruins that are underneath the saucer because it's really intended, this church of the saucer, <laughs> to be located over the home of Peter. Now, this is one of those sites where scholars have real confidence that this was in fact understood by the earliest Christians as an authentic location, as the home of Peter. Because they see a first century home, they see a shrine that was created in the first century around it and in it. In the fifth century Byzantine period, we see uh, more foundations of a church around that. And then we see that wonderful crusader era kind of stuff going on too. So a lot of occupation going on in this one site. When you go up into the spaceship, <laughs> which is run by the Franciscans, by the way, uh, you will see in this round space, you can walk around this place, and on one side of it is an altar area. So people can actually come and hold masses and, and services in this space. But in the center of this donut <laughs> is a round glass almost faceted glass window that you can look down through into the first century home. So those foundations that are still remaining. And you can see what would have been the home of Peter. Later on, we'll hear that story about um, someone trying to lower somebody down through the house roof because while the foundations and walls were stone, we used a kind of local thatching out of reeds for the roof. So it was have been easy enough to part that thatching and put someone down. But the people lived cheek by jowl. Your wall in your house is going to be the wall of the person next to you. <laughs> you know, so it's this real interlaced warren of homes. You're going to really know your neighbors quite well. So it probably helps to be related to them so that if you yell at them, you know, <laughs> you can put each other in, in, in your place. When you're standing at this church of the saucer and you're looking out uh, in a particular direction, very close, you can see the ruins of the Byzantine level of a synagogue, a Byzantine era synagogue. You know, it was because of the various kinds of carvings that were found and what were the lintels around the edging all kinds of Jewish motifs. It is built on top of what is believed to be a first century synagogue. For a long time, scholars thought that must be wrong in the gospel. There were no first century synagogues because we haven't found any. They thought that for a long time. And they thought, well, the temple's so primary. That's the only place they went for worship. Now we're... There are first century synagogues all throughout Galilee. And we're finding those, but it took us a while to find them. So we're learning, that's good. Now, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue on this particular Sabbath. But look what's happening for the man Jesus, the human being. We have a teaching that we just talked about recently, how Jesus is fully human and why that's important. So let's look at this story from a fully human being perspective. Jesus is obviously someone who is well educated. He could have, you know, potentially even been thinking uh, enough about studying as a law, studying in all the uh, potential kind of scholarly pursuits available to him, perhaps even uh, thinking about becoming a rabbi, but he's very well learned. What's more, he's also schooled in the particular type of rabbinical teaching around healing around uh, being able, when people would come to the temple for healing, it was a particular type of rabbi that was responsible for healing them at the temple. And, and 
It sounds a lot like whatever it is that he's studying is a lot like that. He's well schooled. <coughs> so he comes from Nazareth to find John the Baptist out in the wilderness, and boy, does that look like wilderness. Let me tell you, I have been to the Jordan before, but much more north, where it's a little more burdens and small, looks like a creek at <laughs> certain points. But I have not been where we went this last time, which is outside Jericho. Mostly because that is the area of the Jordan where it is believed that John the Baptist was doing his baptizing. But the problem is, in the modern era, that the Jordan River is the international boundary between Israel and Jordan. Israel and Jordan haven't always got along that well. <laughs> so access to this particular area of the Jordan River was very much constrained. The Jordanians would not allow people into that area of the river, except once a year they would allow the Greek Orthodox community once a year to come in and baptize in that area. We have since found foundations on the Jordanian side of the river of, again, those early occupations and churches and shrines that give us confidence that say the early community understood this to be the place where John was doing his baptizing. Only recently, within the last couple of years, have the Jordanians decided to allow general public access to this site. <coughs> but remember that it, for many years, been a battle zone, <laughs> many years been a border, and has a vast three mile wide line of minefield between it and Israel. So the Jordan River minefield. They have opened up a small tract of the minefield, wide enough as a driveway, it's dirt. <laughs> and they've removed the mines from that to allow buses through the area. But this is truly desert. When you drive through this stuff, it is gray, vast, all you can see. Little hillocks and small valleys of nothing but dirt. And now you can see hillocks and valleys where mines are buried or have been unburied. <coughs> the image is very important because it has the same feeling today as it would have had even in the time of John. A time in which the Romans had occupied Judea, and it is in fact the remnants of the battle zone. To be able to say things freely, you have to be outside <laughs> in the wilderness and away from where people can get you. And that's where John goes. But to the symbol of freedom, the Jordan River, the last barrier to the promised land. And he claims that as a symbol of freedom. He's, in, he's basically teaching people that they are on a journey. But where do you go for your connection to God when you're in an occupied empire, when you're asked to worship other gods and goddesses, when your leaders in the temple are in collusion with the empire? Where do you go for justice? Where do you go? Where do you go? Where do you begin? If you're trying to do a, a civil piece of transformation of what's going on, where you go when you have no weapons, where you go, how do you challenge any of that? And John is teaching and having people understand that something else is about to happen and needs to happen for genuine transformation. And who does he pick for that genuine transformer to lead a new movement is Jesus. That's who's revealed to him as that person. Again, no pressure. <laughs> now, here's one possible scenario that makes sense to me, so I'm sharing it with you. Think about it. When Jesus has come from Nazareth to find John in this true wilderness, and he is coming in search of another teacher. He obviously already knows a great deal. But he's heard about John. John has many followers in his academy. And Jesus is interested to be one of those. When he comes to the Jordan River, it's unlikely that he just came for a day, got baptized, and went away. <laughs> he comes to learn from this teacher, was likely there for quite a while, as many likely were. 
And in these conversations with John, I think it is quite possible that John could have then introduced the ideas and teachings of the Essene, which are a community very much as we might think of a monastery. The Essene people were very unhappy with how the temple teachings and corruption had gone. They believed that people could have an individual relationship with God. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And didn't have to be monitored by rabbis, priests, and were not caught up quite so much in the purity codes of Leviticus, and thought the temple system had become corrupt. So they had basically come out and created a new life, for themselves in the desert environment and a new community. That community was very intense, very much like an early form of monasticism. They grew their own food. They had a very rigorous life together that was divided between labor and prayer and study and learning how to do new crafts that would contribute to the life of the community. A very much this intensive scholastic disciplined, <laughs> spiritual environment. If Jesus has this experience of this esteemed teacher, I can well imagine the opportunity to go and be in that community, and scholars do believe that Jesus was exposed to the teachings of the Essenes and potentially that community. It makes sense to me that this time in the wilderness is potentially possible, a time in that community. It makes sense, too, because he would have gone to Jericho, been in the Jordan, going north a little bit, and then going north, further to where the Essene community is located. He's there for some time. We hear these 40 days in the wilderness. That's a symbolic amount of time that tells us that he's going through transformation. And then out of that, he heads farther north. And here's what's interesting. Why go to there, the Galilee, why go to Capernaum? It is right on the edge of the next territory. A few more steps, he goes to the Tobu, and he's outside Judea, and his jurisdiction is in, where John is arrested. He has the opportunity to leave the area, to not be the leader of the movement, to not challenge Herod, to not be there and conscious power in the whole world. He is skeptical, but he doesn't do it. But I think he thinks about it hard. <laughs> His whole journey, in that intense experience of community with these scenes, I think another piece of transformation happens in his thinking, if that's what happened. Because by the time he gets there, he gets to Capernaum and he sets himself up. He does what he knows how to do. He teaches what he's learned. He goes to the synagogue in Capernaum and he teaches. He obviously is well received there with his teaching. They invite him into homes and he's staying there for some time. He's making friends. He knows a lot of people now who are basically become his students. But he's also doing his healing. He knows how to do that. And he's picked up some more things in the Essene community. And they're beginning to bring people. Notice this moment, though. After he's taught, it's Sabbath. He's just taught in the synagogue. And he walks in to Peter's home with some of the other students. And uh, Peter, or Simon, still then, says, my, my mother-in-law is sick. And he knows Jesus is a healer. And Jesus takes care of it right away. It's still the Sabbath when he heals Simon's mother-in-law. Notice, though, how the rest of the people, <laughs> still kind of old world thinking, <laughs> don't bring in anybody until after sunset and the Sabbath is over. So he's already doing transformational work and challenging ways of thinking, the Levitical laws, much like these scenes did. And here comes everybody else at night to bring your people to heal. He is well known. He is safe. He is loved. He is admired. He is respected. It's a great place to be in. But it captures him. I think it captures his heart. And here's what he does that's different from what's gone before him. In the temple belief system, if people are ill and sick or have a need, if they're poor, they're supposed to go to the temple for those things. They're supposed to pay a price for those things. 
They have to buy sacrifices for those things. They have to be considered ritually pure enough for those things, or even to enter the temple to get close to God, because in that belief system, that's all the place where God lives in the temple. John the Baptist, by contrast, says you don't need intercessors like that. That God does not live in a box. God is out in the wilderness. God is free, and so are you. You do not need a corrupt system to put you in touch with God. You can go out and meet him right here in this wild running water and have a relationship right now with me. That completely flies in the face and challenges all of that. Jesus takes both thoughts of the temple and of the wilderness, and he offers a third alternative. Because in that moment when he goes out by himself and he's thinking of all of these things, do I go hide in these scenes? Do I teach in the wilderness? Do I leave the whole kit and caboodle behind me and go into the next region and just get the hell out of here? Or do I do this? I take the wild of God into the homes of the people. They don't have to go to the temple. God will come to them where they live. And it's, it's been written by Paul. I will live as the people live and bring God to them. I'm willing to live whatever context they're in. I'm willing to live the life they live. I'm willing to be, willing to be beside them. Whatever it takes so they have the experience of God and being with them. To bring them the good news where they are, exactly where they are, in mind, body, and heart. Jesus does that third way. And he's sitting there thinking, and they come, and they say this wonderful line, people are searching for you. And he turns it right around. It's time for us to search for them. It's time to go from this safe place where I am loved, where I am well thought of, where I am respected, and where I am safe. We need to leave that all behind and bring God to the people. Hugely radical, challenging stuff. And his community, his students say yes. We will follow you. And he preaches all around the Galilee. And just a couple years ago, they found another first century synagogue <coughs> in Migdal, an area associated with Mary Magdal. People, our opportunity, as we prepare in just another couple of weeks, to walk in to our own 40 day reflection of transformation, is to understand that we are called new things, to take God to where he is, to take God courageously into a world that has experienced the effects of corruption and injustice and empire. And not to meet that world with a sword in our hands, but with love in our hearts. And to do the most courageous thing of all, to love our neighbors as Christ loved us.